Hi there, Smart Drivers talking to you tonight about phantom traffic jams, driving on the interstate, driving on the freeway, and all of a sudden traffic comes to a stop. And there's no apparent reason why the traffic came to a stop. There's no crashes, there's no vehicles on the side of the road, there's no emergency vehicles present, uh, there are no potholes in the middle of the roadway, the sinkholes and those types of things where the road just mysteriously evaporated into thin air and those types of things. So why is there a traffic jam? Why has traffic come to a stop? And why are you sitting on the freeway or the interstate and going nowhere? Because trust me, from a recent trip in Ontario, it was incredibly frustrating to drive on the 401 highway, which is the interstate or freeway that runs from Detroit, Michigan, all the way up to Montreal, Quebec, and I thought, oh, we'll get through Toronto and everything will be fine. And no, every 20 minutes, every 30 minutes driving, it was <laughs> stop and go traffic all the way to Montreal, which is, you know, usually it's a seven, eight hour drive. And it turned out to be more like a nine hour drive because of traffic come to a stop. So it was very frustrating. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, Bricks for, for Wheels is here. Corey is the moderator. Uh, Cooper, hello, my friend. Uh, Ray, hello. And Drive Smart BC, which is Tim, my friend, retired police officer. He has a website. Uh, check that out if you're in the province of British Columbia. Excellent information on traffic safety, highways, road engineering. Uh, court cases, decisions in the courts that have affected the way you drive and what happens on our roadways as well. An excellent forum over there as well that you can engage in conversation with other traffic safety authorities and getting your license and those types of things. So check out Tim's website at Drive Smart BC. Excellent, excellent information there. All right, there we go. Ching is here. I got my South Carolina license last week and I used only your videos. That is awesome. And Tim, you are most welcome, my friend. Uh, Michael is here from the Barbados and a few other people are tuning in. Mallory is here from the Maritimes, my friend, and uh, had some good friends that I finally got to see. Hadn't seen them for some time before my kids were born, which <laughs> is one of those landmarks of time passing when you realize that your daughter is going to be 13 in the fall and I uh, hadn't seen them before the kids were born. It was very good seeing them. And the reason that I mention that is because they are off to the Maritimes to visit family down there. So that was really nice being able to see them and catch up for the very short time that we were able to see each other when we were in Ontario. Uh, Minder, I have my driving test this week. Can you give me some advice? Yes, I can. I'll give you some advice and talk to you about that after the presentation. If I forget, which I probably won't because I always talk about that, and answer those questions uh, definitely remind me uh, so what we're talking about tonight as I said and I have some videos for you as well I want to show you some stuff <laughs> of drivers who think they're invincible <laughs> yes I'm driving my 22 my 2200 pound Chevy Kia my Kia no it's uh, what are they called it's a anyway it's a Kia and they're going up to head-to-head -to -head with a 100,000-pound truck thinking that they don't have to move over or move out of the way. Uh, Amid, how can I pass the driving test in Columbus, Ohio? Uh, practice, you need to do the Ohio maneuverability test because, as you know, it's a two-part test there in the state of Ohio. You have the Ohio maneuverability test, which is the cones, 9 feet apart, 9 feet wide. 20 feet and then 20 feet out farther than that is the nose cone and you either have to go left or right and then you have to back through that those pylons successfully and the, the, the secret to the Ohio maneuverability test stay tight to the driver's side of the vehicle the passenger side will take care of itself so do that when you're doing the Ohio maneuverability test Buify, hello everyone tuning in from Mission BC. I passed my road tests in August 26. Thank you much, so much, Rick. You are a great teacher. And thank you, Buify. That is absolutely awesome news that you passed your driver's test there in Mission. Congratulations. That must be just awesome end of the summer uh, success and a uh, big celebration <laughs> that you passed your license. Really, really awesome news. Thank you for tuning in. So that is really great. All right, without further ado, let's get over to the slideshow presentation here and we'll talk about phantom traffic jams and I'll give you a solution to phantom traffic jams, what we can do to avoid it, especially in those congested, congested more popular places and 
tell you what we're, what is going to happen and what I think is the only solution to this problem. Uh, Luna, as soon as I saw a freeway, I clicked as fast as I could. I've been driving for almost nine months and still haven't gotten the courage to get on the freeway. Uh, Los Angeles drivers are scary. <laughs> Absolutely no doubt, Luna. And uh, some of the busiest interstates are and freeways are in the Los Angeles area, no doubt about it. Uh, the 401 running through Toronto from Detroit, Michigan through to Toronto, Ontario, Canada is the busiest commercial highway in North America. So it's busy, busy, busy. And uh, it seems that there is one part just before Dixon Road that no matter what happens, uh, that traffic is going to come to a stop. If you're driving during, during the daytime, traffic is just going to come to a stop. It's inevitable that you're going to be sitting in traffic jams. My friend Jake is here. Hello, my friend. How are you? Uh, and elevator. I've seen drivers switch multiple lanes at once, and I sometimes get worried that I might get involved in a crash. And yes, they do. And if you are moving across multiple lanes, you can. But pause in each lane as you're moving across multiple lanes because you need to give other traffic an opportunity to realize what you're doing because you're communicating effectively, leaving your signal on, and pausing between lanes so don't just like you know <laughs> skate across there make sure that you come to the next lane pause one two three flashes on the signal and then move across to the next one that will give all the traffic time to cooperate and to help you out when you're doing that uh mallory did you see any rhinosaurs on your travels to and from bc on your trip <laughs> rhinosauruses no i didn't see any rhinosauruses mallory uh, but uh, we did have a good trip and it was incredibly busy, 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 lots of stuff going on. Uh, Jake says the Dagum Gardner Expressway. Yes, that is another freeway in the Toronto area and bumper to bumper. So let's get over to the PowerPoint presentation here. Phantom traffic jams that we're talking about tonight. Traffic on interstates and freeways, expressways coming to a stop and there is no reason no reason that you can fathom or figure out why traffic is coming to a stop. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tim says, yes, if I read correctly, a reduced speed and steady driving will avoid these odd stops. Been a while since I read about traffic waves. Yes, and uh, we're going to talk about that. And Actually, Joe isn't here tonight, but Joe is the one that put me onto this. It's bilateral control, which is space in front of your vehicle, space behind your vehicle, and constant speed control. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I get through the presentation here. Bear with me. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. And yes, I do have a PhD in legal history. Uh, the 1990s, I drove truck between Ontario, Canada and the United States, mostly the eastern seaboard, but I did make it out to the western states, southwestern states, Arizona, Utah, and those types of places uh, once or twice. Well, I went to university in Australia. I drove for Greyhound in one of the regional bus lines there. Became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. Uh, interesting note about becoming a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997 is that uh, in the province of Ontario, Canada, you can you are certified to be a truck driving instructor <laughs> and air, teach air brakes, but you are licensed to teach uh, new drivers in cars. And I did it backwards. I went and got my certification to teach truck driving and air brakes first came out, went into the industry, realized I couldn't get a job, and then I had to go back and do the fundamental course on teaching new drivers how to pass uh, a license and how to do, so it's a two part, it's in class and then it's in the vehicle. And I had to do those two parts and then I could get hired as a commercial driving instructor. <laughs> so I had to do that. Then I went to went back to university, did a graduate degree in legal history, and uh, in 2015 started the Smart Drive Test YouTube channel. It's been successfully, you know, wildly more successful than I could have ever imagined. Uh, we're next this month, next month in early September, we're going to hit 250,000 subscribers. Incredible, incredible number of people that we've been able to help here. So stuff to see, uh, driving near semi-trucks, have a look at that video if you have some trepidation around driving around larger vehicles, especially on interstates and freeways. If you're going out onto that, you're going to definitely encounter 
these larger vehicles. And if you're coming up for your driver's test, uh, listen to the podcast, uh, failing eight reasons that you will fail your driver's test. And you can find, uh, actually, Corey will put those links up for you because I was think I was uh, remiss in putting those down in the description for you. But Corey will put those links up for you to help you out. So social driving, you are up against the problem of social driving no matter where you're driving, but even more so on freeways. It's the one thing that unites us as a human race, regardless of religion, politics, or race. Most, I would say almost every driver would say, I am a good driver. Yes, there are some drivers who have fear and anxiety around driving, but with a bit of experience, most drivers believe that they are a good driver. The problem with driving is, is that minimal training and education around getting a driver's license. Most people now with the graduated driver's licensing system are doing about six to eight weeks of practice before getting their license. Uh, For most, uh, it is optional to take driver education and driver education does little more than teach them traffic laws right of way and basic vehicle controls. So I would argue that education in North America and most places in the world, not Germany, (laughs) I've got quite a number of comments about people in Germany who think that driver education and getting a license in most other places in the world is a bit of a laughable subject. So don't talk to Germans about that because they do have a rigorous uh, driver education program. So this is what happens. And then people are left to the devices of social driving they go out and they watch what other people are doing and they mimic what other people are doing it and because that's what other people are doing that's what we do because it's a social activity and we participate in that activity and we do not want to be shunned reactionary drivers follow too close and bear with me one sec here This is what most drivers think is a good following distance. And I nick say that, <laughs> ixnay, that is not in any stretch of the imagination a good following distance. You are riding the bumper and you are tailgating the vehicle in front of you. So it is far too close. But unfortunately, this is what most people think a good following distance is. Drivers follow too close. Drivers stop too close in traffic. You should be one vehicle length from the vehicles in front of you and they stop too close to other road users or they pass too close to other road users. Minimum three feet between you and other vulnerable road users. Motorcyclists, cyclists, and pedestrians. There is so much room on the roadway and many people will think, no, that's not true. But yes, there is. In front of your vehicle and behind your vehicle, we can create more space. Yes, side to side. No, there's not a lot, great deal of space there, but we can create more space in front of our vehicle and we can maintain that space. But many people do not. Boot to bonnet. This is what I call nose to tail. We drive nose to tail in traffic. Think about a grocery store lineup where you're waiting at the cashier to pay for your groceries and you're standing behind the person in front of you who you don't know. Complete and utter stranger. We have absolutely no gumption of standing behind that person at 6 inches, 12 inches, and we do not know that person. This is the theory about driving. Because we drive nose to tail in the same way that we stand in a queue waiting to pay for our groceries at a grocery store, we will follow closer than we would if somehow we managed to have (laughs) traffic where we were driving face to face we would maintain our personal space bubble. We would maintain more space, but we're up against the very phenomena of driving in traffic nose to tail. The other problem with this is when you get clusters on the freeway or traffic waves is what uh, Tim called them and have been referred to in the literature is that people crowd right up into the cluster and become part of the problem of driving. What happens is is that when one driver breaks, everybody behind him breaks and it is incrementally compounded. So one person breaks and starts the ripple effect of everybody breaking. The person behind them breaks a little bit harder, the person behind them breaks a little bit harder and so on and so forth. And once you get to the 50th vehicle, they're breaking to the point of they're coming to a stop on the freeway. Misperceptions, because people are too close in queues, 
they follow too close because they think they're going to get there faster. They think if they maintain space be behind the vehicles in front of them that they're going to get there sooner when in fact it's the complete opposite thinking. And this goes along with so many things in life when we're educated about something and we learn that it is a complete and utter misperception. The other problem is, is when you're right up tight against the vehicles in front of you, you have no out. You do not have a minimum safe distance and you are much more liable to get rear-ended. So you want to have bilateral control. The bilateral control is in front of your vehicle and it's behind your in behind your vehicle as well. And the way that you maintain the distance behind you is if somebody's tailgating, you can tap your brake lights, you can ac activate your four-way flashes, especially on your freeway, and all of a sudden you come up on one of these clusters that are coming to a stop and there's nobody behind you, turn your four-way flashes on to indicate to people behind you that there is something wrong and amiss and that they'll come to a stop. Here is another issue with driving on highways, and this is one of my new pet peeves is people that think that they can maintain a constant speed on the fuel pedal. You can't. You simply can't. Your speed is fluctuating. So say that you're doing 60 miles an hour. Your speed is fluctuating from 55 miles an hour to 65 miles an hour. I just rented a budget cube van and drove to Lake Country from here in the cube van. It did not have cruise control and I was fluctuating anywhere from 105 to 95 kilometers an hour in that vehicle. Frustrating. I hate vehicles that don't have cruise control because I want to have a constant speed in the vehicle. And this is the other thing that contributes to phantom traffic jams because people slow down and then the person behind them is too close and they have to brake and the person behind them brakes and then they brake and then the next thing you know the whole thing is coming to a stop unpredictable actions and uh, are erratic and without warning people do crazy things as we were talking about earlier about changing multiple lanes people will just move across multiple lanes without signaling without moving and here i'll show you somebody who is invincible uh, bear with me one sec here. There we go. Okay. Oh, here's a video. There we go. This is congestion on the 401. Is it working? There we go. This is just at just before Dixon Road in Toronto, and the traffic comes to a stop almost every time at this point on the number 401 highway in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And for those of you living in Los Angeles and other large metropolitans, this is probably a morning rush hour thing that this is something that is just constantly happens all the time. And I thought that once I got through Toronto, I wouldn't be dealing with this anymore, but this was pretty much every half an hour, 40 minutes, all the way to Montreal, Quebec, uh, that we were dealing with coming to a stop. And there's no reason for it. It's because people are following, drivers are simply following too close. All right. Uh, Next one, technology. I am of the mind now that I believe that technology is going to be put in place to reduce these traffic uh, problems on our freeways because what's happening is, is because people cannot maintain constant speeds, people cannot uh, maintain a safe following distance behind the vehicles in front of them, what's gonna happen is, is uh, authorities are gonna have to put technologies in place to reduce congestion. They're going to have to put in warning systems. And this technology already exists with adaptive cruise control. That if you're too close to the vehicle in front of you, the vehicle is going to apply the brakes and automatically implement that following distance in front of you. As well, it's going to maintain a, a constant speed for you. So warnings in the vehicle and trucking companies are already using this technology to monitor and to police their drivers. So if they're using this for CDL drivers, it's a matter of time and I would be on board with this, that this needs to be used to reduce congestion on our highways and our freeways. Okay, Tim, have a great dinner and uh, yeah, that'll be great if we can see you before the end, my friend. All right, so following too close, failing to give way and here I have a good video for you on failing to give way. Uh, it's even got a little music here, so bear with me. Uh, nope, not the right one. Apologies about that. There we go. So this is the tractor trailer. He got out into the passing lane and was passing this little car here, which I think is a Kia. 
And uh, the problem with the big truck is, is that it's not that the big truck's not getting it going. It's the fact that the big truck is governed at uh, 100 kilometers an hour. As you can see with the speed down in the corner there, I've sped the video up. And he gets beside this car and this car just does not refuse to give up at all to let off the throttle and the big truck can't get by him. So eventually the big truck puts the signal on and tries to get back over and the car just refuses to move. And then just goes out and passes and it's like, really dude? <laughs> so this is what we're dealing with out on our freeways and highways. All right, so the other thing that we need to do is we need to implement a culture of moving over to the right and giving way to other vehicles. Highly populated uh, countries in the world, Europe, South America, and other countries have a culture of driving that if you're on the freeway, you need to get back over to the right. If you don't, you're going to get flashed, you're going to get honked at, you're going to get tailgated. So these countries have... a uh, culture of moving back over to the right and if we implement we bring this culture into North America then we too will move to eliminate congestion on our freeways and highways because this is the problem people unable to maintain a constant speed and people too close to the vehicles in front of them so good luck in your driver's test and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer we'll get back over here there we go, and a few questions. Elevator often use cruise control maintaining a constant speed, and yes, and we thank you for that, for using cruise control, because let me tell you, I've driven a lot of highways, uh, because when I go to Ontario, the joke with our family is, is, I'm in the car, I'm in the car, because you basically have to drive everywhere. <laughs> so when people are on the fuel pedal and they're up five and they're down five you can't keep a constant speed and you're you just got to pass them and it cr sets up a dangerous situation in terms of passing so if you can get on the cruise control and keep a constant speed you know i don't care as long as you're doing this posted speed limit if you're on cruise control that makes it so much easier for everybody else behind you all right uh and Tim said, by definition, half of us are less than better than average drivers. Yes, that is very true. Elevator, the driver behind me went over the painted island when I was merging in Lafayette, Indiana, and I thought I wasn't going to be able to move over even though I had my signal on. And yes, and sometimes, uh, Elevator, if you're trying to merge and other people are being dummies, such as that, where they're driving over the painted island and not allowing you to get over, just let off the throttle. Let them go in front of you and then just merge in behind them and do what you need to do, okay? Uh, Tut. Hi, Rick. I hope you're uh, doing well. Yes, it's been a minimum the last time I left a message in your comment section. It was 2019, but it's great that you're back. Thank you for tuning in. That is awesome, my friend. Uh, Tyrell, I call that a wall of chrome. <laughs> and it is a wall of chrome. I mean, imagine sitting in a little coupe, little mini Kia. Kia. And you're like, there's a truck, like a massive truck. It had two tag axles and it was loaded with steel. And the signal's on. I mean, the signal is right there. It's on the side of the trailer. And the guy is not moving over. It's crazy. That, like, I just, I sat behind that for that video. Uh, was th two minutes of that guy driving there. And it's like, you just, you couldn't let off the throttle just a little bit to let the poor guy back in because... This is the other thing. These trucks are not being vindictive. They're governed. They can only go 60 miles an hour. They can only go 100 kilometers an hour. The reason that is, is for fuel economy, first and foremost. And second, it's for safety. So the trucks are governed for a reason. Trucks haven't been governed for 30 years. So know that. It's not that the truck driver is being a, a dummy or out to get you, it's the fact that he or she can't get the truck going any faster. It only goes so fast. All right. Uh, Jake says, our fleet has adaptive crews, can uh, overreact at times, but I use it constantly. Also, a plug for Mastermind Group, questions about driving with trucks, you and I and many others, always available. Uh, Jake, that sounds like a, a tremendous idea for Mastermind Group. Uh, that would be really great to set up. Uh, maybe that's something, uh, Jake, that we could set up uh, over in the uh, Smart Drive Test uh, group, the Facebook group over there. We could do that. That would be really awesome. 
Uh, elevator, I've seen drivers hang out in the left lane when there are a lot of drivers waiting to go faster, which creates traffic congestion in the left lane. And elevator, you're exactly right. Left lane squatters, as uh, they have been tagged here on the Smart Drive Test channel. Uh, left lane squatters, oh my god. <laughs> Talk about upsetting uh, Tracy, my girlfriend, who drives her Audi and drives like a crazy person. Uh, don't tell her I said that. Uh, you know, just wants to go fast. And there's these people that sit in the left lane. Oh my God, it's so annoying and frustrating. It's like, just get over. Uh, Brody, what should I do if the drive through forgets my medium drink at any KFC or Taco Bell? Well, that's between you and the fast food franchise, so you'll need to go and talk to them. SB, what exactly does ACC help with in driving? I'm starting to use this while driving, but it seems to me it uh, rides slower. Okay. Adaptive cruise control. Excellent question, SB. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, and uh, leave questions down in the description. Uh, for those of you watching here on the live stream, if you're watching on the replay, leave a comment down in the comment section there if you have any questions about driving and technology. And that is an excellent question about adaptive cruise control. Adaptive cruise control has sensors in the front of the vehicle that pick up on the vehicles in front. So if you're set your cruise control at 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour and you come up on a vehicle that's going slower the adaptive cruise control the sensors in the front will indicate that that vehicle in front is going slower and will slow down the adaptive cruise control to maintain the space between your vehicle and the vehicle in front and you can change that following distance in the adaptive cruise control you can change it from two seconds four seconds or six second following distance on most vehicles and it will keep you safe and it's a little bit of an adjustment with the adaptive cruise control because you will figure out quickly you're on the freeway you set your cruise control at 60 miles an hour 100 kilometers an hour and you can figure out when you're coming up on a big truck or a vehicle that's going slower you can figure out what the distance is and then you can time it so that you move over to the left lane and come out around without the vehicle slowing down but if you get too close, then the, the adaptive cruise control will begin to slow down the vehicle uh, to maintain that safe, that minimum safe distance between your vehicle and the vehicle in front. And this is what Jake's uh, fleet has on his vehicle. Their vehicles all have, adapt have adaptive cruise control. And actually on some of these big trucks now with their fleets, there's no option. You can't have the old cruise control that just sets and the speed you now have just the adaptive cruise control now the thing is is if you kind of <laughs> you get a little distracted when you're driving you may figure out that the vehicle in front of you is actually going slower than you want to go and but it's maintaining that space and you've been driving slow for the last 10 or 15 minutes which can be a little bit annoying but if you're paying attention figuring out what's going on when you're driving you can time that so that you're coming up on the vehicle and you're like oh okay there's the there's the distance before the vehicles, my car starts slowing down, change lanes, get over and around, and away you go, and uh, you're going to be golden. So that's adaptive cruise control. Uh, Mallory, when you are driving at night and it starts to rain, what should you do? Uh, Mallory, uh, if you can turn on your high beams headlights, even better. Definitely turn on your windshield wipers for whatever speed you need, to forever, how, how, however hard it is raining. <laughs> this is the other thing. I went down to Michigan to do a presentation for one of my clients down there while I was in Ontario and hit some torrential rain. And, you know, I can count kind of on both hands the number of times in my driving career that I've actually had to turn windshield wipers on high. Uh, it's rare when I hit that kind of rain uh, to turn the windshield wipers on high. Most of the time I just turn them on low. Other things that will help you in rain at night is to apply Rain-X to your windshield or you can add it to your windshield washer fluid and that will help sheet the water off the windshield. So that's another technology that you could do. Uh, and just going on with uh, vehicle maintenance for just a second in terms of Rain-X, good windshield wipers, make sure that you have good windshield wipers, make sure that your headlights are clean, especially you know now we're starting to see fall a little bit, winter's coming. We get a lot of spray and dirt off the roadway on our headlights. So the other thing at night, if it's raining, make sure that your headlights are clean. Okay, more so in the winter than now, obviously, but make sure they're clean. And uh, while I was home, I we, we bought a van for my mom for her 
because she wanted a van, so the kids all got together and bought her a van. We wax the van, and paste wax is much better than just the wax on, wax off kind of liquid wax that you buy. So if you're going to do that, it's a little bit more work to apply, but it's a much better wax. Uh, Kumquats, I'm a newish viewer, and ever since you started driving, I have always uh, felt as if I were zoning out while driving. It's like I can't focus while moving. Any tips with that? I drive an old Jeep, by the way. Uh... <laughs> if you're driving an old Jeep, that in and of itself should keep you uh, focused on your driving because I'm sure that that would uh, pose some challenges in terms of driving, steering, going around corners and those types of things. So I'm not sure how you're zoning out with your old Jeep. <laughs> but uh, one of the things you can do is listen to audiobooks, listen to podcasts that will give your mind something else to tune into so that you can hone in on driving. The other piece about driving, and one of the reasons that why we tend to zone out a little bit with driving, is driving is a right brain activity. And our right brain is responsible for spatial orientation. Whereas our vehicle in relationship to other vehicles on the roadway. The, the, the challenge with that is, is that our right brain is not responsible for artificial time that's our that's a left brain activity so rational thinking mathematical calculations rationale artificial time is all a left brain activity but driving is primarily a right brain activity so somehow you have to keep the left brain engaged and you can do that through listening to audiobooks or podcasts on your uh in your vehicle and whatnot having a conversation with somebody else in the vehicle and whatnot now whatever you do yeah don't watch videos don't participate in social media, don't be texting and those types of things. But audiobooks, podcasts, all of that will help you out. Also, talk radio will help you out. So know that uh, when you're driving. Okay, Mallory says it's raining there in Nova Scotia this evening. Uh, I have some friends holidaying there, so that's unfortunate. Uh, SB, it's a clown everywhere you go. Good luck uh, on your next test. You're not alone going back to retake mine in October. And good luck on taking retaking your test. Uh, my friend Epic, another thing to do on freeways if it's a four lane one, uh, use your mirrors and shoulder checking more frequently to avoid side crashes, otherwise uh, stuck in your lane with no option to overtake, common in Pennsylvania. Yes, and uh, three, four lanes, the best lane to drive in on a freeway uh, if it's three or four lanes is the second lane from the right. You don't want to be in the right lane because that's the lane that's ex uh, vehicles are exiting in that lane or they're getting on the freeway. So your best defensive posturing is the second lane from the right. I mean, unless you're you know in a hurry and want to get there fast, then yes, you want to be out in the left-hand lane. But for the most part, second lane from the right is your best defensive posturing when driving on a highway or freeway. And for some of you that has... Uh, some anxiety and trepidation around driving on freeways and highways, that's one of the things that you want to do is definitely stay on that side of the freeway uh, to keep yourself safe, maintain that following distance in front, and keep up with, the with you know, if you have your driver's license, keep up with the posted, uh, with the traffic flow. If you don't have your driver's license, stick to the posted speed limit on the freeway. Elevator texting and driving is against the law. Yes, it is elevator in most of the U.S. states and in Canada, the 10 provinces and territories. But many people are still doing it. <laughs> and, you know, it's the saying that I have that traffic laws no more prevent traffic crashes than criminal law prevents crime. Unfortunately, people are still doing it and unfortunately doing it at a very high rate, which is disturbing. So... We need to figure out a solution for that. There are possible solutions, but most of them are too aggressive and too radical for most people to accept. Kumquats, that sounds like a good idea. We'll try that next time I get out. Awesome. Uh, Tut, uh, that's awesome. And I'm doing the written test first before I do the road test. And good luck to you as well. Awesome. I love the encouragement between smart drivers. Now, I had a question uh, at the beginning to talk about driver's test and uh, give some tips and strategies around that. Driving tests are four components regardless of where you are in the world. Speed management, space management, observation, and communication. You have to have those four pieces in place 
to be successful on your driver's test. Now, before I launch into those four pieces of the driver's test, seven eighths of the driver's test is in a forward motion, driving on a city streets, left turns, right turns, those types of things. One eighth of the driver's test is slow speed maneuvers, two point reverse turn, parallel parking, backing into a parking space, three point turn. At minimum, you must be able to back into a parking space, parallel park, and three-point turn. Most people in most states, most provinces are going to do those three maneuvers. The only exceptions to those are California, Ohio, and Maryland. I don't know of any other state, any other province that doesn't do it. Just those three. Ohio, Maryland, California. California, sometimes Oregon, make you back up 50 feet along a curb and don't think it's easy because it's not because you can't see the curb it's tough there's a video here Corey will put that up for you as well in Ohio you have to do the Ohio maneuverability test and me personally I would advocate that every state every province does the Ohio maneuverability test because it's an excellent maneuver it's tough and it demonstrates your ability to control the vehicle and do slow speed maneuvers unfortunately Ohio is the only place that does it in Maryland, you have to do two-point reverse turn. You have to back around a corner, okay? So those are the only three states that I know of that don't parallel park. For everybody else, three-point turn, parallel parking, back into a parking space for the purposes of a driver's test. Most new drivers despise having to learn how to parallel park, having to learn how to back into a parking space, or how to do a three-point turn. I will tell you that if you can do slow speed maneuvers well, you are going to be a better driver overall. And the reason for that is because you will learn mastery of the primary controls, the gas, the gas pedal, the brake, and the steering wheel. If you don't have control of those, you're not gonna be a very good driver. So know that slow speed maneuvers will make you a better driver overall. The second thing that slow speed maneuvers teach you is where your vehicle is in relationship to other things because the goal and aim of driving well is not running into other things <laughs> and being successful in not running into other things is knowing where your vehicle is in space and place in other words knowing where your vehicle is in relationship to other traffic and other fixed objects light posts curbs traffic islands trees buildings those types of things okay so that's the goal the four tools of a driver's license test, space management, speed management, observation, and communication. Space management, following distance of three to four seconds, minimum stop in traffic so you can see the tires of the vehicle making clear contact with the pavement, stopping at controlled intersections at the correct stopping position before the stop line, before the crosswalk or sidewalk, and if those two conditions don't exist, just before entering the intersection at the edge where the two roads meet. As I say about space management, if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. Speed management, for the purposes of your driver's test, you must do either the posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. And what I mean by that, if the speed limit is 30 miles an hour, you need to be doing 30 miles an hour. If the traffic flow is going 25 miles an hour, then you're gonna do 25 miles an hour because you can't go faster than other cars already on the roadway. The other thing about speed is you need to recognize the different road user groups and the different speeds and how fast they're going in relationship to you. This goes back to the slow speed maneuvers. For example, you're driving 30 miles an hour. A person on a bicycle, unless they're a racing bicycle, they're only going to be doing 15, maybe 18 miles an hour. So you have to realize that there is a speed differential between your vehicle and the bicycle. You have to realize that there's a speed differential between you and a pedestrian. A pedestrian is traveling at approximately 6 miles an hour. You're traveling at 30 miles an hour. So therefore, there is a speed differential of 24 miles per hour. This is the reason that we have implemented school speed zones to try and reduce the speed differential because if we can reduce the speed differential, studies have shown that we reduce the likelihood of crashes if we can reduce that speed differential. And as well, if we can reduce the speed differential between two group road user groups, we can also reduce the severity of the crash. We can reduce fatalities on our roadways. All right, 
So space management, speed management, observation. You need to have a forward scanning pattern in place. Far down the road, in, check your center mirror. Far down the road, check your instrument panel. Far down the road, and then your two wing mirrors. All right? Shoulder checking every time that you move the vehicle sideways. Shoulder checking every time you turn. Left turns, right turns. And before reversing, you need to do a 360 degree scan around the vehicle and you need to look out through the back window. Yes, you can use a backup camera for the purposes of your driver's test. Check your mirrors. But for the most part, you need to be looking out through the back window when you're reversing with the vehicle. Communication. The ways that we communicate with other traffic on the roadway. The position of our vehicle on the roadway communicates in tent. For example, if there's a vehicle in front of you and they're hugging the left side of the lane, there's a good chance that they're going to merge left in front of you. If a vehicle is in the left turning lane, there's a high probability they're going to turn left. If there's a pedestrian standing close to the crosswalk, there's a high probability that he or she is going to cross the roadway. So the position of the road user on the roadway communicates intent. As well, lights and signals. And we know that a lot of people don't signal, but for the purposes of your driver's test, you need to signal. Minimum three flashes of the turn signal before you move the vehicle. So if you're going to merge left, one signal, two signal, three signal, shoulder check again, the way is clear, then you can proceed. Third way, uh, eye contact with other road users if you're not sure what they're doing. Hand gestures, you can go whatnot and then finally the horn but use the horn sparingly in this day and age because it's seen as a sign of aggression so sparingly so for example if you're sitting at the traffic light and the light turns green and the vehicle in front of you doesn't go then just beep and then oh yeah okay and then they got to go so that's the last one so just quick review of that Seven-eighths of the driver's test is in a forward motion. One-eighth is going to be your slow speed maneuvers. For most people, it's going to be three-point turn, parallel parking, and backing into a parking space. It's those three slow speed maneuvers that are going to give you the most grief. However, spend the time, master the slow speed maneuvers. You will become a better driver overall because you have a mastery of the primary controls, the gas pedal, the brake, and the steering wheel, and you will know where your vehicle is in relation to other traffic and other road users. And then space management, if you're not near anything, it's less likely you're going to hit something. Speed limit, posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. Observation, scanning patterns forward, shoulder checking, shoulder checking, shoulder checking. I can't say that enough for the purposes of a driver's test. And then reversing, 360 degree scan, looking out the back window. Yes, you can use a backup camera. And then communication, the five ways that we communicate position of your vehicle on the roadway, lights and signals, eye contact, hand gestures, and horn. Those are the ways that we communicate with other traffic on the roadway. Gupta, I can say that the UK is the worst country to drive in, so ridiculously undisciplined. Uh, thank God we are in Canada. Had a bad experience there. <laughs> it sounds like you did, uh, Gupta. Yes, uh, driving in the UK. Uh, Mallory, when my parents and I are on the road, I like the shoulder check from the passenger seat just for the fun of it. And it's always helpful for the people <coughs> who are driving if other people in the vehicle are paying attention to what's going on because that's going to help you out. I mean, you know, other people do that. And uh, I know a number of elderly couples who are driving and... Uh, <laughs> The, the husband can drive the car but can't see, and she can see, so she's telling him what to do and where to go, and he's driving the car. So that happens. And this is the other piece that you need to keep in mind about social driving, is that <clears throat> you have no idea who the person is behind the wheel of that vehicle that's around you and you're sharing the road with. Know that they could be high, they could be drunk, they could be senile, uh, have their driver's license for a very long time. There's two vehicle, two people driving the vehicle. So this is the other reason that you want to maintain space from other traffic on the roadway is because you have no idea who that other person is. So know that. Uh, Adam, unfortunately, I broke my dad's right brake lights because of it. How do you mean? I must have missed the beginning. I've been trouble with reversing, especially between cars or when parallel parking. I seem to be hitting either the curb or the car on the back. 
Uh, blind spots, passenger sides. Uh, Adam, you can't park by Braille, okay? You can't back into the car behind you. What I would suggest to you is go and get some of those one meter tall, three foot tall delineators. Go to the parking lot or some other place where you can practice and then use the pylons to get a good sense of where your vehicle is in space and place. Do some of the maneuvers. Corey put the video up on uh, parallel parking, uh, or the slow speed maneuvers rather, and do some of those exercises and that will really help you out in terms of parking and doing that, okay? Uh, my friend Big Mac Sam, class is in session. Hello everyone, hello my friend Big Mac Sam from the Bronx there in New York. That is awesome, tuning in. And it is, has it been a good summer for you, Sam? I just got back from holiday, so I'm all tanned and you know feeling refreshed and ready to go back at it. So yes, it's been awesome. Uh, use your camera if you have one and be three feet away from the car while parking. Uh, good luck, someone taught me this. Yes, uh, if you have a camera, you can use your camera, but still, get those fundamental uh, skills, driving skills in place. I watched somebody, I was sitting in Montreal, visiting my friend and somebody parked out in front of him, parallel park and they like they didn't touch the car behind it they didn't they didn't smash into it either but they did bonk it pretty good and i'm thinking oh you're parking by braille using the force but not using the force well uh so you know don't be one of those people learn how to drive well be you know have some pride in your ability and skills get better at what you do the problem with so many people is, is they think because they have a car just like they think because they have a camera that they can take photographs the bottom line is is no you can't you really can't <laughs> okay and i see lots of people who are like that so you know be be proud of who you are and try and be the best that you can be in terms of your skills and whatnot all right uh SB Appleman, I'm always worried when merging on a small on-ramp, like it ends quite quick. Okay, so Appleman, when that happens, don't rely on just the acceleration part of the on-ramp. Use some of the on-ramp to get going as well. And, you know, uh, pick your spot before you come out. And I've had this question numerous times, scores and scores and scores of time. What happens if the acceleration lane ends or it's really short? If it's really short, uh, and I know that there are some parkways in New York and other places that it's like super duper short or it's basically a stop sign coming out onto the parkway, then yes, you do have to stop. But for the most part on, you know, freeways, you're just going to have to get your foot into it and you're going to have to get comfortable, you know, pedal to the metal, maximum acceleration and get it going as best you can, okay? Vivian, I uh, just joined in here and I am a new learner. How and when do I use the clutch manual car? Okay, so Vivian, <laughs> all right. Uh, we have a whole series on manual transmissions and how to drive manual transmissions, so have a look at that. The other thing, Vivian, if you're just setting out with learning how to drive a manual car, you have to learn clutch control first. You have to learn the point where the clutch engages the transmission and the drivetrain and begins to move the vehicle forward both forward and in reverse first and reverse are going to be your toughest gears in a manual transmission master those first master clutch control and then you'll learn how to drive a manual car faster once you master first and reverse and can get the vehicle going without throttle just the clutch the rest of it's going to come fairly easy but i would suggest that you work with somebody who knows how to drive a manual car look at the videos here on the channel Corey will put up the playlist for you and all of that will help you out in terms of learning how to drive a manual transmission uh sb how fast should i drive in highway tunnels uh sb uh, i would suggest you keep up with the flow of traffic or the cautionary signs most of these tunnels are going to have cautionary signs and most of the time i can tell you with some certainty that when it comes to tunnels, when it comes to underpasses, and any time that the light condition changes, the traffic is going to slow down. And so you can just slow down with the traffic and move through the tunnel, and that's going to uh, keep you safe and uh, keep going there in the tunnels. Because uh, when I was in Madrid uh, in June, there were a lot of tunnels, a lot of the highways in Madrid go underground, so you're in a lot of tunnels there. All right. Uh, Epic, if you are in the UK, Ireland, 
Dual carriageways, motorways, watch out for the LHD vehicle since they have different blind spots. Uh, yes, some things in Australia. Yes, if you have larger vehicles, trucks, pickup trucks with boats, trailers, utility trailers, caravans, uh, tractor trailers, dump trucks, any larger vehicle is going to have bigger blind spots. So it's imperative that you keep more space around your vehicle away from those types of vehicles because as Epic just pointed out, they have larger blind spots and they can't necessarily see you and they don't all yet have cameras. So know that that is going to happen uh, when you're out on freeways, when you're out on highways and driving around and in the vicinity of these vehicles. And that was one of the videos that I suggest you have a look at, driving in and around semi trucks, bigger vehicles, and that includes cube vans, cargo vans, you know, those uh, cargo vans, Mercedes, the Dodge, uh, all of them have them now that they just have a set of mirrors on them and there's no windows in the back. The Amazon vans, <laughs> stay away from them because they have plenty of blind areas and sometimes the drivers don't look properly because driving those Amazon vans, driving the uh, Purolator vans, the FedEx and those types of things, they, they have a car license. So unless they have a bit of experience driving bigger vehicles, sometimes they fail to shoulder check correctly, they fail to move their head correctly, they fail to mirror check correctly, and they don't look into their blind areas. So know that and keep your space around these vehicles. Uh, Klaus, hello Rick, how are you doing? I watched your videos since uh, fall. 2019, that's awesome, Klaus. I'm so glad that we can help out. If you have any questions, uh, drop us a note. We'll definitely do what we can to help you out, my friend. SB, does ACC keep you in lane also? No, it doesn't. Uh, adaptive cruise control is only forward. What you're talking about is lane assist, and a lot of newer vehicles, late model vehicles, will have lane assist. So if there are clear markings on the highway or freeway yes they will keep you in your lane if you have lane assist uh turned on so i have heard people who've been on freeways who've been on highways with lane assist and adaptive cruise control and have to do very little to drive the vehicle up and down the highway so that's another technological advance that we are automotive technology that we now have in vehicles that will help you to drive and to keep you safe on our roadways. Uh, Stacy, I'm a beginning driver and I am having problems turning the car. Okay, so Stacy, I would strongly encourage you to go to the parking lot and work with the pylons, do the slow speed maneuvers, and that will help you with turning the car. Now, saying that, I just back up here and ask you the question, you don't have any physical limitations that's causing you difficulty manipulating the steering wheel you can manipulate the steering wheel uh, so if you can do that then that's something that you need to do is to figure out how to do that if you don't have a place to work a parking lot to work with pylons and those types of things try and work in a low density area in a suburb somewhere where there isn't a lot of traffic and those types of things and you can practice that turning the vehicle left and right and figuring out how to manipulate the steering wheel also know that the steering wheel turns one and a half revolutions in each direction for full turning. So one and a half, and then you can, you know, you know, you have full turning. So for most turns, if you're just moving around a car or something like that, it's going to be quarter turn. If you're making a hard right turn in a suburban area, it's going to be a full revolution. And if you're in a tight space, you might turn the steering wheel all the way. See the videos on steering here on the channel. That'll help you out with your steering and helping you manipulate that steering wheel. Uh, elevator, some vehicles have lane departure. Yes, they do. And uh, one of the things that I like on my Garmin dash cam that I have is it has lane departure. If you can see the lines on the roadway and I depart out of that lane, now it could be a little annoying if I've rented a bigger vehicle, but in the buggy, it will tell me when I've departed out of the lane. So I kind of like that a little bit because, uh, you know, we're not always 100% paying attention when we're driving. So that, that technology can help you out a little bit. Uh, John, thanks to your videos. I passed my driver's test in the first try. I learned so much. Thank you. And John, that is awesome news. Thank you so much for stopping back and letting us know that you were successful in passing your driver's test first time. Congratulations. That is awesome. 
And uh, what are you doing to celebrate, my friend? Uh, passing your driver's test there. Sam, yeah, summer is not too bad for me. I have to watch that sun. Too much vitamin D. <laughs> Sam, I think we're all like that. We need, we get too much sun for sure. I gotta, you know, definitely now that I'm missing a bit of my hair on the top, I gotta definitely gotta keep a, wear a hat and whatnot. We did make it down to Canada's Wonderland for a little bit, and I forgot to take a hat with me because it was kind of last minute and uh, had to go and buy a Canada's Wonderland hat to, uh, you know, <laughs> not power the the uh, solar panel on the top of my head too much. Uh, Tim's back. Hello, Tim, my friend. And Corey's put up the video on steering smart there. Uh, Mallory, been watching your videos since the spring of 2020. I enjoy all the information and things that I've learned thanks to your channel. And thank you for that endorsement, Mallory. That is awesome, my friend. Uh, Jake, in photos I posted in Mastermind, the lane departure camera is slightly visible in the upper center of the windshield, not uh, an active system just beeps or buzzes and Jake yeah that is similar to what my camera does my dash cam in my vehicle however there is lane assist uh, that will actually steer the vehicle back into the lane on these modern vehicles and this is probably something that's coming on CDL vehicles on commercial vehicles as well so it's just a matter of time. And as I said, in terms of the phantom traffic jams, I think, and from what I know in terms of history, my the work that I've done with my dissertation and whatnot, I, you know, and I've argued this for a long time, that it's technologies that have fixed traffic problems. And I see technology in terms of space management, maintaining a two to three second following distance, and cruise control, adaptive cruise control are the ways that we are going to fix the phantom traffic jams on our interstates and freeways. I don't see any other way of doing it because people, for whatever reason, are convinced consciously or subconsciously that they need to be up as tight and close to the vehicles in front of them to get there as fast as they possibly can and to try and launch a public education program that would educate people that they need to maintain space around your vehicle I think is going to be a fruitless enterprise I don't think that it is going to work at all I think that the way that we are going to need to do this is either foster a culture that we get people to move over to the right and we have that left lane as a passing lane or we simply implement the technology that on no, all new vehicles as of 2030 they all have to have adaptive cruise control and they all have to have warning systems that will maintain that two to three second following distance uh, to the vehicle in front of it. it simply won't let you get any closer than that. And unless we do that, then we're stuck with phantom traffic jams in North America because we don't have the culture that Europe has, that South America has, that other uh, highly congested areas have of moving over to the right lane and getting out of that left lane and keeping it clear uh, for other traffic on the freeway. Therefore, we're just we're just we're stuck with this. We're stuck with these phantom traffic jams. Uh, Jake, wait, can't wait to see all of this techno mumbo jumbo with Alex and Hugh on the ice roads. <laughs> yeah, the ice roads. Too funny. You know, Jake, the funny thing about the ice roads is I watched two or three episodes of that because it took me two or three episodes to figure out how fast they were going. And uh, <laughs> they're only doing 20 miles an hour. So they're doing like 30 kilometers an hour on the ice. And uh, I still, I can't believe that they made a whole series of trucks that are going 20 or 30 kilometers an hour. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> it just makes me laugh. Uh, because after I figured out how fast they were going, oh my God, this is so boring. And actually at one of the truck driving schools that I was at, we had one of the instructors who was a former truck driving, who was an ice road trucker. And he was teaching the guys that they could go around a corner in second gear in a big truck, which is painfully slow, incredibly painfully slow. <laughs> uh, saying I'm going to give my drive test on a manual transmission car. And Singh, where are you going for your driver's test? You're going to take it on a manual car, my friend. That is commendable. We applaud you on taking a manual car. SB, what is the button to keep you in your lane called? Is it ACC? Because my car uh, pushed my car to the side when driving because I was too close by a uh, parked a UPS truck. Now I'm thinking I 
Uh, no, uh, it's not adaptive cruise control. Adaptive cruise control is spaced to the front and maintains a constant speed. Uh, lane departure assist is something different from adaptive cruise control, but when you're out on highways or freeways, uh, lane departure assist and adaptive cruise control can work in tandem. The two of them can work together to keep you in your lane and to maintain that minimum following distance in front of you. And exactly what Tim just said, we are selfish drivers. Exactly, we are selfish drivers. Uh, me first, and that's exactly what social driving is. And if you've been here for any amount of time, uh, social driving, me first, reactionary, retaliatory, we follow too close, hoping on a wing and a prayer that we can get our vehicle stopped That you know, in case the vehicle in front of us does something goofy. And the same thing, I'm on the 401, and uh, you know, I'm hanging back from the clusters and vehicles are passing me and going around me and going tight up against the clusters and they're just contributing to the congestion. They don't realize that. And uh, you know, when my son <laughs> rerouted us up onto the toll road on the 407 to come around Toronto and he's like, oh, did I do the right thing, dad? I'm like, yes, you did because I'll pay the toll all day long to get around that congestion instead of driving through Toronto, so. Uh, Big Mac Sam, nope, not me driving on just ice. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> uh, come on, Sam, it'd be fun. It would be fun. Uh, elevator, I'm not a selfish driver. Well, that is awesome to hear, my friend. Great live stream tonight. Thank you so much for participating in the live stream. All your questions, all your comments makes it really great. And uh, if you have any other questions about driving, want something answered, leave a comment down in the comment section there. And uh, if you're watching in the replay as well, Leave a comment down in the comment section. Hit that thumbs up button. Always appreciate your feedback and questions and comments. All of that makes us absolutely great. We're going to have a big celebration for the 250,000 subscribers. And we'll see you next week at this time. And if you passed your driver's test the last couple of weeks, congratulations on that. If you have a driver's test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.